Today, I want to welcome you to part three of a series entitled Mind Games. Mind Games. It's been a series really on our thought life, taking control of our thought life, and really understanding that God didn't give you fear. He didn't give you doubt. There are certain things that come into our mind, and we kind of entertain any thought at any given time. Well, if you've missed any of the messages, I want to encourage you to go back and watch them online because I believe that they can really help you. Now, let's read our theme verse out. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Can we read this out loud, everybody together? Come on. Take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Somebody say every thought. Come on, say every thought. It's funny because my wife and I bought our first house when I was 21 years old. It was the biggest fixer-upper you probably have ever seen. Graffiti on the inside. I'm not going to tell you what I was picking up on the inside. Boards on the windows. No hot, ro no, no running water. It was, it was like you turn the water on and it looked like root beers coming out. And so we flipped it. And I should say, we, it was more like a slow roll because it took us two years. So we made some money, paid off college debt, bought a couple used cars, had a chunk to put down on another house. The only thing I did not care for in this house was the front door because the front door was see-through, had glass windows. The whole thing was just glass windows, glass, glass, glass. So if you came and knocked on our door, you could see into our living room. Now, we live in a society where they kind of insinuate if somebody knocks on your door, you have to open the door. I don't feel that. There was one day a guy came walking to our door. I'll never forget it. He knocked on our door. I was walking by with a bowl of cereal. I looked at him, nodded, and kept on walking. Just because you knock on my door doesn't mean I have to answer. I don't know what you're trying to sell. Well, in the same way, there's a lot of thoughts that come knocking on your mind. Just because these thoughts come a knocking does not mean you need to let them in. Take captive every thought, every thought, and submit that to the authority of Jesus Christ. Because here's what I know, that our lives are affected and directed by the way we think. Say that with me. Our lives are affected and directed by the way we think. This morning, our message is entitled, Make Up Your Mind. Have you ever been to a restaurant before with somebody who could not make up their mind? Some of you are looking at somebody sitting next to you. He's talking about you. You know what it's like, right? You know this person. You're there. The menus are placed on the table, and they tell the waiter or waitress, two minutes, give us two minutes, two minutes. Waiter or waitress comes back in two minutes, and they are not ready. They say this, hey, you guys go first, and then when it comes around to me, I'll be ready. Everybody else orders, comes to them, and they are still indecisive and not ready. Then they start asking questions. What are you getting? What are, you, what are you ordering? What's good here? What's good here? So indecisive, and you're hungry, and you're like, would you please just make up your mind? I wonder how many times we have started <laughs> to get dressed in the morning time, and you change your clothes repeatedly. Come on. How many know that most of your clothes are on the floor anyway? <laughs> I wonder what the record would be, like, for most change clothes in a morning session. And do you know anybody like this in your family? Come on, wave your hand if you know somebody. If, you, if they're here, point at it. No, don't do that. That's church. You shouldn't do that in church. So if you're, if you're there and you're waiting on them, you're like, would you hurry up? Just make up your mind already. So indecisive. Well, the word indecisive by definition means that you're not able to settle an issue. You haven't settled the issue. You're still vacillating back and forth, back and forth. It doesn't help that we have 50,000 thoughts go through our minds on average per day. 50,000 thoughts every single day. Why are we doing a series about this? Because those 50,000 thoughts affect decisions that you make every single day. And those decisions that you make affect the way you live. So those decisions based on your thoughts affect the way you live. And I'm here to tell you, everybody, it's important that we make the right choices, but it starts with thinking the right thoughts. Every decision is based on a thought. You've never made a decision before that hadn't been birthed in a thought. Here's a little exercise. Everybody wave, wait, raise one hand in the air. Okay, put it down. Some of you raise your right hand. Some of you raise your left hand. Some of you said, I ain't raising my hand. 
And that's cool too. But my point is, every one of you made a decision based on a thought. Immediately you had a split thought, a split second thought, and you made a decision based on what you were thinking. And so we don't just have 50,000 thoughts going through our mind every single day. On average, the average person makes 35,000 decisions every single day. 35,000 decisions every single day. That's 1,458 decisions every hour. That's 24.3 decisions every minute. Collectively around the world, that's one, that's a quarter of a quadrillion decisions that humanity makes around the globe every single day. And it's not easy because there's so many options. Have you been shopping recently at the grocery store? There's not one cereal. <laughs> Have you ever counted the cereals? There is more than one cereal, ladies and gentlemen. There's actually, are we counted? Set, or there's 150 different types of cereal. And not just cereal, like honey bunches of oats. How many love that one? I, did, I was curious. I was like, how many different types of honey bunches of oats are there? So I pulled it up. There's honey bunches of oats with almonds. Mmm, love that one. There's honey bunches of oats with banana bunches. Sounds fun. Honey bunches of oats with toffee almond granola. Honey bunches of oats with French vanilla almond. Honey bunches of oats with granola apple make on, uh, pe uh, pecan. What did I just say? Macon? It's not a word. Honey bunches of oats, honey roasted. Honey bunches of oats with granola. Honey bunches of oats, whole grain honey crunch. Honey bunches of oats with apples and cinnamon bunches. Honey bunches of oats with real strawberries. They have to say real because you look at it and you're like, this is spongy, is it real? And they're like, yes, it's real. Honey bunches of oats with cinnamon bunches. Honey bunches of oats with vanilla bunches. Honey bunches of oats with grain almond crunch. Honey bunches of oats with pecan and maple brown sugar. Honey bunches of oats with protein, granola, dark chocolate. Honey bunches of oats with regular chocolate. This is just cereal. And then you go to the toothpaste aisle. There are, 50, there are 50 different types of toothpaste. Come on, how many are Crest people? You're Crest people. Die hard, Crest people. How many are Colgates? You're Colgaters. Come on, where are my Aquafresh people at? People are like, woo, you're making noise for toothpaste. What are we doing here? How do we even make a decision when there's so many options? You're making choices every day based on a thought, and life is full of decisions. Sometimes they're small, like, which toothpaste do I use? And then there's others that are large, like, who do I marry? But many of us know what it's like to have a hard time making a decision. It's like the psychiatrist who asks his patient, hey, you have a hard time making decisions? And he said, well, <laughs> yes and no. You know? <laughs> we all know what that's like to make decisions every single day. In the morning, is it cereal or eggs? Is, do we go golfing or go to church? Do we study or watch TV? There are decisions based on decisions and more decisions that define the way we live. And you're going to have a lot of decisions to make this week, but you will never make a more important decision than to follow Jesus. Yes. Yes. Joel, Joel chapter 3 verse 14 paints a picture for us. And he says, there are multitudes... How big is the multitude? I don't know, but it's a lot. So much that he says it twice. Multitudes. Multitudes in the, watch this, the valley of decision. It's a great word picture. In the valley of decision. And for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Meaning they're kind of in the middle. They haven't made up their mind to go on this mountain or that mountain. They're just somewhere in the middle. If I could put it in today's vernacular, it would be you're on the fence. Anybody ever been on the fence about a decision? When you're on the fence with God, it's not comfortable. First of all, because you are close enough to see him, but too far to experience him. I don't want you just to know about God. I want you to know God for yourself. Because there's a lot of opportunity for people to know God. But a lot of people are in this valley of decision. They have not made up their mind. And I want to help you make up your mind because I don't want you just to know about him. I want you to know him personally. Because Matthew chapter 7 is a great verse. Jesus is talking, not in your notes. But he, Jesus is talking. He's like, hey, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the ones who did the will of my Father in heaven. He said, there's going to be a lot of people on that day that says, hey, Lord, Lord, listen, we did a lot of religious stuff in your name. Like we, we, we did this in your name for you, Jesus. And he's like, hey, guys, there's going to be some people 
that don't make it because he says, depart from me, I never knew you. That word know in the Greek is gnosko. Say gnosko. You guys are so smart, you know Greek now. He says, they never gnoskoed me. They knew about me, but they didn't know me. And God is not into some religion. It's about a relationship that he wants. Yeah. I was with some friends and they were talking about another guy. And they were like, man, this guy is amazing. He's a great leader. And one of them turned to me and said, Sean, you know this guy, right? And I said, well, I've heard about him, but I've never met him for myself. Listen, just because you hear us talk about Jesus every week does not mean that you know him for yourself. I want to encourage you to know him for yourself. Don't just be somebody who hears about Jesus and, and, he, and, and thinks, man, I think I know him. Let's walk in a personal relationship with God because I believe Jesus wants to be Lord of our life. Can I hear a good amen, everybody? Okay, listen, if you're in the valley of decision, let me help you today. There's a few reasons why people don't give their life to Jesus. Write this down. Number one, some people have not seen his love. They haven't seen his love yet. Now, I think Jesus and church have a branding problem. They don't have a, an issue with who they are, church or Jesus, but they have a branding problem, a marketing problem. Meaning, most people, when they think about Jesus and the church, they're like, man, I don't, wanna, I don't want to go to church. It's just like this list of rules. It's a bunch of things. It's going to take the fun out of life. Can I tell you, that's not Jesus. Jesus has some things he wants us to do for our benefit and our safety. And, and at some point, you have to determine, does God's word have the right to determine what's right and wrong? Because if he does, then we can help you. Like, here's the next steps. If, if you're like, no, God's word does not have the right to say that in my life, then, then it's going to be problematic in the future. But none of us got into any relationship for the rules. That's not appealing to us. Some churches are like, you, you, come to our, you come to our church, here's the rules immediately. Boom, 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 boom. God's not saying... You have to adhere to rules. He's like, I want your heart. There's going to be some things that I'll work on in you, he says. But first of all, let me just have your heart. None of you got into a relationship for the rules. I did not get married for the rules. I got married for the loving. None of us are drawn to... We don't see God and be like, hey, look at all the rules. Man, I'm in. It was the kindness of the Lord that drew us to repentance. And if you've not seen the love of God, let me encourage you, look closer. Because I will show you a God who has loved you to the depths. He became sin for us, became a solution to our sin problem, died on a cross, rose from the dead, and now offers eternal life to everybody who calls on his name. Come on, is there anybody in the room today that's grateful for the extravagant, reckless, amazing love of God? changes our life. I see that love and I say, oh, I'm in. Because of how you love me and what you've done for me, I will gladly now surrender my life to you. Take a good look at his love. John 3, 16 is the famous verse, most famous verse in the entire Bible. Matter of fact, a guy walked into a doctor's office one time and saw a walnut shell and a piece of paper with the words John 3, 16 scribbled on it. He asked the doctor, what is that? The doctor said, that's the gospel in a nutshell. It is. It's encapsulating the entire gospel in one verse. For God so loved the world. He didn't hate the world. He loved the world. And he loved the world so much, it compelled him to give his one and only son, Jesus Christ. So whoever, which by the way, whoever believes in him doesn't have to perish. They can have everlasting life. I love the word ho whoever. Whosoever. Who, it, like it's, it doesn't matter. Okay, let me just tell you, that is a wide door. Some of you are like, hey, I'm going to invite some people to our house, having a little party. Anybody's welcome. You don't mean that. God means that. It doesn't matter what your background is. The door is open. Old, young, rich, poor, black, white, Asian, Filipino, Samoan, Hispanic, other You can be up and out. You can be down and out. It doesn't matter where you've come from. The door is wide open. Whoever wants to put their faith in Jesus Christ, he says, I want you to know there is the potential to have your life completely changed because God so loved the world. Come on, somebody say a good amen. amen. 
Some of you know John 3.16. You may not know John 3.17. The very next verse says, For God did not come into the world. He didn't send his son to condemn the world. But he actually wants to save the world through him. That's why he came. He's not coming pointing fingers at everybody. He's like, no, I'm sticking a hand out. Let me help you. Let me rescue you. So you need to step back for a moment and take control of the thought that you're not loved. Because sometimes you wonder, does God even love me? I think God loves me when I'm doing good and then doesn't love me when I'm doing bad. Nope. The Bible says nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing can separate you from his love. He loves you when you're doing good. He loves you when you're doing bad. There's nothing that you could ever do to separate yourself from his love. You ask my wife, do you love Sean? Absolutely. Do you like him today? Not today. Not today. Because your love from God is not predicated on your performance. It is determined by your position as his child. When you get that, It'll change the way you think. It'll change the way you make decisions. It'll change the way you live. I want you to see the extravagant love of God. 1 John 4, 16 says, So we've come to know and believe the love God has for us. Some of you know about it, but do you believe it? Wow. <laughs> Let's take a little int introspective look into your heart right now. Today, do you think God loves you? So many of you are like, yeah, I'm in church. Absolutely. My neighbor's saying yes. I'm going to say yes as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm going with yes. Final answer. But inside your heart, you have questioned the love of God. I don't ever want you to question it again. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Here's another reason why people don't give their life to Jesus immediately. And that is, write this down, shame. There's a thought of shame that comes in your mind. Shame is dangerous, guys. Shame is this. It's a wrong view of yourself and a wrong view of God. Guilt is about what you've done. You feel guilty. Shame is about who you are, your identity. You start to think, this is now who I am. And it pushes you away from God because when you feel shame, you don't want to go to church. You don't want to pray. You don't want to lift your hands. You don't want to read the Bible. You don't want to do anything for God because you think, I, I'm, not, I'm not good enough. And it's almost like a hook in your soul and in your mind the devil puts there. He says this. It's almost like whenever you try to take a step towards God, the devil pulls on that and says, who do you think you are? Do you know what you've done? You don't deserve. God doesn't want you. You're not loved. They won't accept you. There's no way. You're damaged goods. You're soiled goods. You should be ashamed of yourself. Can I tell you, with God, it's not shame on you. It's shame off of you. Jesus is trying to get the shame off of us so we can come to God. Shame keeps us from coming to him. And he's like, that didn't come from me. When is shame ever okay? When is shame ever from God? Never. Search the Bible. It's never, it's not there. In the New Testament, God is not like, shame on you, shame on you. He's like, hey, come to me. Come to me where you are. I want to love you. Let me show you my love, and I'll, re I'll recycle all of the pain. Yeah. So some people are filled with shame, and they're not sure what to do. So I think it's important that we understand the Bible and read the Bible and understand the love of God. Here's some great verses I'm going to read. And by the way, I'm going to give you a hint. This is a great place to clap your hands and say amen. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word. Next verse says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance of faith that faith brings. Many of us are scared to come to God. We're like, I can't come to God. No, it's actually possible. He's inviting you. Come to God. We can have our hearts sprinkled and cleanse our conscience from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. Next verse says, if we confess our sins, guess what? He's faithful. He's just. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. He'll purify you from all unrighteousness. Come on. Next verse says, don't be afraid. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old is absolutely gone. Behold, all things are brand new. Come on, somebody take three seconds and clap your hands and thank God for the new. Shame keeps us from God. It's just a thought, though. It's what's crazy about our thoughts is that you could be anywhere in the world at the grocery store, but nobody knows what you're thinking. That's where the battle is won or lost is in your mind. 
So no wonder Paul comes on the scene and says, hey guys, take captive every thought and submit that to the authority of Jesus Christ. Here's another reason, another toxic thought that comes in our mind why people don't give their life to Jesus is because of doubt. Doubt is a big deal. And may I also recommend a book called The Case for Christ. It's by a guy named Lee Strobel. The Case for Christ. He was a journalist, didn't believe in God. And he actually set out to disprove Christianity and Jesus Christ. And in his process of investigation, he realized there is such an overwhelming response to the evidence that there is for Jesus that he became a Christian and now has been preaching the gospel of Jesus for the last 30 years. <laughs> Doubt is a horrible barrier that keeps us from coming to God. There was a woman one day, she went to a salon. She sat down in the beautician's chair and the beautician began to do this lady's hair. And they talked about everything that was going on in life at that moment and somehow landed on the topic of God. To which the beautician said, God does not exist. I don't believe in God. And the woman in the chair said, how could you say that? The beautician said, well, if God existed, then why are there hurting and broken people outside on the streets wherever you go? God does not exist. The woman in the chair realized she was not going to win this argument. So she ended up finishing her hair and she paid her money. And this woman walked outside the door and began to go to her car. As she was walking down the street, she saw another lady coming towards her. This woman's hair was a dirty mess. Unkempt hair, split ends, <laughs> disheveled. And the woman thought about it, turned around, walked right back into the salon, opened the door of the salon and said, beauticians do not exist. The beautician stood back and said, what are you talking about? Like I literally just did your hair. Beauticians do exist. I just finished doing your hair five minutes ago. The other woman said, no, no, no. Beauticians do not exist because if beauticians existed, there would not be people on the streets with disheveled and unkempt hair. The beautician said, no, no. Beauticians do exist. The problem is they're not coming to me. And the woman said, exactly. Can I tell you today, there are hurting and broken and empty people all over planet Earth. The problem is not, does God exist? God does exist. They're not coming to Him. And it is our responsibility to help people come and see the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Come on! Yeah. Doubt is such a toxic thought. Here's why. It's, not, it's so toxic, not because of what it does to us, but because of what it keeps us from doing. Yeah. Doubt keeps us from coming to God. No wonder the enemy has been attacking your faith. There's so many scriptures. James 1 5, not in your notes, this is for free. <laughs> James, the half brother of Jesus, he records, by the way, he's the half brother of Jesus. Okay, how hard would it be for you to convince your brother and sister that you're God? <laughs> James gave his life for preaching Jesus. This guy says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. Meaning he's not going to tell you all the reasons you don't deserve it. He's gracious. He will give it to you. But when you ask, watch this, watch this, you must believe and not doubt. Why? Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the winds. And then it says that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is a double-minded person, unstable in all their ways. So we're to come to God and not doubt. Well, what do I do with my doubt? Investigate. I had a conversation with a young man just before service. He was like, well, I'm just, it's my first day. I believe in God, but I have some doubt. I'm like, okay, we're going to work through that. Yeah. We're not expecting you to jump the, all of a sudden today if it's your first day. We have people that have just started, that have haven't started, that have been going for 20, 50 years. We're all somewhere on the journey. And we want to help you take your next step. But at some point, the Word of God gives you so much faith that you begin to step out. Let me explain something to you. Ephesians 2, Paul says this. We are saved by grace. Grace is giving you something you don't deserve. How many are grateful for grace? We don't earn salvation. We don't work for it. We couldn't be good enough for it. God has a standard we could not meet. And Jesus said, I'll meet that standard for you. Let me lift you up to the standard. For by grace are you saved. Watch this. Through faith. It's, it's not from yourselves. There'll be no suspenders in heaven. You know why? 
First of all, it's, they're tacky. Secondly, I'm kidding. Nobody would be like, hey, I got to heaven because I'm such a good person. He says, nope, this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so nobody can boast and brag. So we're saved by grace through faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, it's impossible to please God without faith. You read that, and now you understand, oh, now I know why the devil's been attacking our faith. Now I know why the thoughts of doubt have been sprinkled in my mind and planted a seed that's growing because now the Bible says that we can't please God without faith. He didn't say it's hard to please God. He said it's impossible to please him without faith. And we're saved by grace through faith. So no wonder the enemy has come back and tried to destroy your faith. Listen, there's a guy in the Bible named Doubting Thomas. It's kind of, he got a bad rap. That's kind of jacked up. <laughs> he doubted one time and we're like, Doubting Thomas. We don't look at Peter and like, lying Peter. How many times have you doubted? I should be called Doubting Sean. This guy doubts Jesus one time. Gets a bad rep. And Jesus raises from the dead and appears to people. And, and Thomas wasn't there. So the disciples are like, OMG, texting Thomas, Jesus is alive. Fist bump emoji. Like, I can't believe it. And Thomas is like, ooh, y'all need to slow down. I don't know what you've been drinking because I haven't seen him. I don't believe it. And then Jesus made a house call and showed him the scars in his hands and the scars in his feet. And Thomas buckled and said, my Lord and my God. And Thomas, this doubting Thomas, would go on to preach the gospel and he would give his life for preaching it, meaning the people that were listening didn't like it and he died. They thrust a spear through him. For preaching Jesus. Interesting thought. The book of martyrs talks about how the disciples were murdered for preaching Jesus. There are a lot of people in the world who will die for what they think is true. A lot of suicide bombers are killing people, giving their lives for what they think is true. There's not one person who could convince me that these disciples died for what they knew was false. Every one of them died a horrific death. Peter was crucified upside down. James was thrown off a building and finished with clubs. Thomas was thrust through with a spear. Some were burned at the stake. There's no way. If they knew that they made this stuff up about Jesus being raised from the dead, at some point, one of them would have said, All right, hold on. We made it up. Take me off this cross. Put the fire out. Don't you stab me. <laughs> but not one of them did that. Why? Because they had seen the resurrected Savior for themselves. They said, you can do whatever you want to to us. I am convinced. I am persuaded. I have seen Jesus. My you want to kill me? That's fine. I've seen the resurrected Lord. I'll just be with him earlier than expected. But you cannot change my mind. I know in whom I believe. These are eyewitnesses, ladies and gentlemen, who have seen Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to take control of your mind again. Don't just entertain any thought that comes in. Remind yourself of God's love. Remind yourself of his mercy. And for everybody who's kind of in the valley of decision, everybody who's on the fence, everybody who's still indecisive and hasn't settled the issue, may I encourage you, step back and weigh out your options. Look at the love of God. Look at the grace of God and the mercy and the joy and the peace and the hope and the healing and compare and contrast that to what the world has to offer. Because God has never been weighed and found wanting. The emptiness and the pain that we all have experienced is nothing in comparison to what God has to offer. Can I hear a good amen? amen. Joshua chapter 24. He says, now fear the Lord and serve the Lord with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors that they worship. Throw away anything, all the other false deities in our lives and serve the Lord. And then he says this, he says this. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Like, let's make up our mind if we're going to follow Jesus. He's talking to people who had witnessed the miracles of God and yet they still hadn't Follow God. Do you know it's, it is actually possible for you to see God and see the miracles of God and yet not follow 
God. He turns around, he's like, I want us all to choose today whom we will serve. Then he says this. He says, but as for me and my household, shoot. We're going to serve the Lord. What is that? It's a made up mind. He's making up a mind. Can I encourage you? Number one, write this down if you're a note taker. I think it's important. Let's make up our minds to follow Jesus. To follow him. To not just hear about him, but to follow. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Do I go to church occasionally? Do I give a little bit? Do I do something nice for people? What does it mean to follow Jesus? I guess there would be a lot of different answers. If we were to pose the question to, to humanity, what does it mean to follow Jesus? But when you step back and you see the love of God and what's available in God, we have two decisions. Number one, we either ignore and reject God or we accept him. And when we accept this, we literally lay down our lives and say, God, I will obey you. I'll serve you. I'll trust you. I'll live for you. My entire life is for you. I'm giving my life to Jesus. Some people step back and they're like, hey, you know what? Serving Jesus, I just, it's so hard. You know, it's so hard serving Jesus. It's so hard. Listen, serving Jesus is easy. Half stepping is hard. You got one foot in and you got one foot out. You're too into God to enjoy sin, but you're too into sin to enjoy God. It's this mushy middle. You got one foot in and one foot out. This is not the hokey pokey. This is your life we're talking about. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, I think we ought to ask the one we are following. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, he says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. We died our whole life and we say, God, I'm giving you my entire life. Why? Because the next verse says, No one can serve two masters. You can't serve two, two masters. Either one, you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Nobody could do that. You can't serve both God and money is the context here, but you can fill in money with anything. You can't serve God and something else. Why? Because God is first. He only fits in first. Some of us, we have God on the list, but he's not first. He's like number three, number four, number 17. He doesn't fit in 17. He doesn't even fit in second. He only fits in first. So the writer of Matthew says, I want you to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Put him first in everything. And then all this other stuff will fall into place itself. Let's make up our mind to follow Jesus Christ completely because he is both Savior and he is Lord. We love the aspect of Jesus being a Savior. Oh, come save me, save me, save me. But we don't like the aspect of him being Lord. You cannot separate the two because he is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. So we say, God, I'm going to make up my mind to follow Jesus. Number two, write this down. Let's make up our minds to surrender our entire life to Jesus. Because sometimes we're like, okay, God, you can, have, you can have the living room, you can have the kitchen and the bedroom, but I have this den I don't want you touching. Matter of fact, it says do not disturb on it, so I don't want you coming into this part of my life. What if we surrendered every part to Jesus? Why is it that we hold on to our lives so tightly? I play, was playing Nintendo, not recently, back during the 1900s. <laughs> Do you remember Mario Brothers? Okay, I was playing Mario Brothers, and I couldn't beat a level. So my friend who'd beat the whole game kept nudging me, trying to take the controller out of my hands. like, hey, let me beat the level for you. Let me beat the level for you. I'm like, man, I don't want you to beat the level for me. He's like, give me the controller. Give me the controller. I don't want to give the controller to you. I want to beat the level for myself. But the problem was I couldn't beat the level by myself. I kept hearing that stupid noise when you die on Mario Brothers. You die and we're like, doo, 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 doo. He'd be like, let me get the controller. Let me see the controller. I'll beat the level for you. No, nope, I'm going to do it myself. Over and over, I kept dying. I couldn't do it no matter how hard I tried. Finally, in frustration, I said, here, take the controller. He beat the level and took me to another level that I couldn't get there by myself. In the same way, at some point, ladies and gentlemen, you will run into frustration in life, thinking to yourself, I got this, 
I got this, God. I'm bad. I got, I'm Mr. Independent. I can do the answers within me. No, the answer is not within me. The world will tell you it's in there. I ain't got the answer. Neither do you. We need to come back to God and say, God, take the control of my life. I willingly give it to you. And you watch as your loving, precious Savior takes you to another level you have never seen before. Why don't we surrender their entire life to Jesus Christ? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. But in all your ways, every area, submit to God. You watch him make crooked paths straight. How many need some crooked paths to be straight? That only comes through step one through three. Let's give him our life. And John 15, 5 says this, that Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. And then he says this, Apart, if, you're, if you're connected to the vine, you'll bear much fruit. Like you'll, you'll do great things for God. Once you're separated from the vine, the source, he says you can actually do nothing. Let me say it another way. Um, when you give roses to people, Valentine's Day's coming. You're going to give roses to your wife or your mom, your grandma. We think it's so special. Oh, thank you for the flowers. It's so beautiful. It smells so beautiful. Mm. Okay, well, it's great. It's great. Watch this, though. You're giving them death. The moment you cut the rose off of the vine, it begins to die. It's pretty death, but it's still death. Jesus said, as long as you're connected to me, you're going to bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let me put it in today's vernacular. As, as long as my iPhone is plugged into my charger and the charger is plugged into the wall, my phone is at 100%. The moment I unplug my phone, my phone begins to die. Let's stay connected to the source. Let's stay connected to Jesus. If he is really everything that he says he is, let's give our lives to him and watch him change the way we think, which change the choices we make, which changes the way we live. Number three, number three, let's make up our minds to repent. Repent. Whew, that's, that's kind of a harsh word, Sean. Maybe you grew up in church and you heard preachers like yelling, repent, repent, you need to repent. Have you seen somebody on the road saying it with a sign, read it right back. Okay, you think it's a scary word. Okay, here's what it means. Here's what it means. It means you turn around. Whew, scary. It means you were going your way and you literally turn around to go God's way. It's, it's a turning of. Here's the problem. Most of us are like, I'm going to go my way. I'm going to live life for me. And we turn around, we see God. We're like, hey God, I see you. Out of my peripheral, I see you. And God's like, hey, turn to me. No, 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 I'm good. I just want to know that you're, you know, you're somewhere back there. I know you're, you're out there somewhere. And then we continue to go our way. I heard the definition of insanity growing up was a, go, repeating the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. How, how fulfilled are you going your way? Because I don't know about you, but I know what emptiness is feels like. I know what brokenness feels like. And Jesus, the writer of Luke in Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, repent and turn to God. Okay, why, why would I do that? Because here's the guarantee. Your sins will be wiped out. Not swept under a rug. Not covered. But your sins can be completely erased before God. Watch this. And then a season of refreshing will come to your souls. You feeling dry spiritually? That doesn't come from you running harder in your own lane and your own way. It comes from a turning to Jesus Christ. You're like, repent. Ah, I can't. Is that a possible? We ought to thank God. He still allows you turns because we're going our own way and we're like, oh, this isn't the right way. And on the freeway, wherever we are, that's where I have a small steering wheel. This is how I turn. Mm, mm. turn around. Thank God he allows us to. Repent. Turn to God and the season of refreshing will come from the Lord. Jeremiah 6 verse 16 says it this way. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads like there's a fork in the road and look and ask for the ancient path. Where is the good way? Where is that good way? He says and you, then, 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 then you walk in it. So you ask, you look, where's the good way? Discover the way, and then you walk in it. Watch this, and that's when you find rest for your souls. Well, what's the good way? 
there is a good way, there's a wrong way. We don't get, I don't get mad at the signs that tell me I can't get on the freeway going the wrong way. They're just trying to take the fun out of life. It's, it's trying to save me from an accident. I mean, God's like, hey, there's a right way, there's a wrong way. We ought to be asking, okay, what is the way? And then John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. And so we look at Jesus, and we see his love. We see his grace. We see the fact that he paid for our sin when he didn't have to. And if he paid, listen, hell is not a place where people, God sends people he's mad at. Hell is a place where people go to pay for their sins if they want to. I'm just encouraging you, don't pay for your own sins. Jesus already paid. I've never paid for somebody else at a restaurant and they get up like, hey, I need to pay now. I need to pay. I need to pay. No, it's already been paid. You don't need to pay twice. Just accept the payment that Jesus has already paid. He paid for your life. There's a little boy. He made this boat out of wood. He carved it. He sanded it. He made the sails. He was so proud of this little toy boat. Took it down to a river one day and he set it in the river with a little string and he ran up and down the embankment over and over, had so much fun until a current came and a wind came and blew the string out of his hands. He ran down the river as much as he could and he didn't know what to do to get his boat back. Finally, there's bushes and trees. He couldn't run any further and the boat sailed off to where he couldn't even see it anymore. He didn't know this, but an older man picked up the boat, took it into town and gave it to a shopkeeper. Three weeks later, the little boy was walking to school and he saw his boat in the window and he's like, that's my boat. He went to the shopkeeper. He's like, hey, mister, that's my boat. Can I have my boat back? It even has my initials on it. Look, I made that boat. The shopkeeper said, whoa, son, if you want this boat, you're going to have to buy it. Little boy went back home and mowed lawns and sold lemonade. Finally, one day, brought a paper bag filled with his money and put it on the counter, the same height as him. The shopkeeper counted all the money up and said, son, this is the exact amount. Here is your boat. This little boy took this boat and he hugged it on the way out. He said, little toy boat, you are twice mine because I first made you and now I have bought you back. Can I tell you, God Almighty loves you with an everlasting love. He first created you and then sin separated us. And he says, I'm willing to pay for your life, to give you everything of me. I bought you back and now I want to serve you, God. I look at his love and I respond. If you're in the valley of decision, if you're on the fence, can I encourage you? Let's make up our mind to give our life to Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that your life will be easy from here on out. I wouldn't lie to you like that. It just means that you'll find rest for your soul and a promise for, for, for tomorrow and, and eternity. And I believe God wants to do that even in your life today. Come on, would you stand to your feet with me? We're going to sing this old song before we leave. This is a song of surrender. And I don't know about you, but I have some songs that when I hear them, they take me back. My dad's church used to sing this song. And I remember several places in my life where I sang this song as a prayer to God. And I remember crying. I remember being at the front of the church, kind of kneeling by the stage. I remember being at a camp. And I would we'd sing this song. And I, I created a moment between me and God. And when we surrender, we're telling him, God, I give up. Here are the controls of my life. Forgive me for, for playing my own game. I'm going to take a conscious decision, give you my heart, my mind, and my soul. And you watch as God brings the rest. So as we sing this, I wonder, can you just create a moment where you are? Many of you grew up in church, you'll remember this song. For some of you, you've never heard it. Maybe you want to do something to tell God, I surrender. Maybe you're good. But you're like, man, I, there's that one area of my life I just haven't really so surrendered to the Lord. I'm going to give them that today. You don't fix yourself before you come to God. We come to God. He's the one who does the fixing over the time and over our lifespan. But we come to him as we are. Maybe you want to lift your hands. Like, why are they lifting hands? Well, this is the universal sign of I surrender, right? <laughs> Any country, if somebody's like, hey, give me your wallet. Woo, I surrender. In church, we lift our hands. We're saying, I surrender. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you that area of my life. But I want to, in the next two minutes, can you just take a second and just tell God, I'm making up my mind to follow you.
sing this together. still closed. Maybe you're here and you're like, Sean, I need to surrender my life to God. I need to give him the controls of my life. Or maybe you were once close to God, but you've drifted. We all know what that's like. Life got busy and you're not as close as you once were. I'd love to lead you in a commitment prayer right where you're standing. I'm not going to call you to the front because our heart's not to embarrass you. It's to connect you to God. If you say that's me, whether you're listening online or listening in the family worship room or in this place, I wonder on the count of three, if you say, Sean, count me in that prayer. I'm giving my life back to God. I need a fresh start. On the count of three, could you just lift up your hand? Come on. One, two, three. Lift it up. This is me. Yes, 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 yes. Leave it up. Yes, 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 yes. Come on, there's so many hands. Every hand represents a soul that God absolutely loves. And allow me to lead you in this prayer. I'll give you the words, but just beat it to the heart of God. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me first. Today I respond to that love. And I give you me. Forgive me from my sin. Wash me clean. Thank you for your grace and your acceptance. Be my Savior and my Lord. From this day forward, I've made up my mind to follow you. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody say a good amen. Come on, let's clap our hands for everybody who prayed that prayer today. Great job. So proud of you.